I should explain at the outset that my contribution is a, uh, more of an overview uh, as a paper and not focused on a specific research topic. Uh, so please bear with me. I'm going to go through a number of uh, issues uh, fairly rapidly, so please have patience. Uh, it's almost a commonplace, at least in certain circles, to point out that the 10th century was a period of initial literary consolidation for Judeo-Agriculture. <coughs> culture that was quite distinct from the Jewish culture or cultures which had preceded it. Cultural processes which had begun in the 9th century or earlier now found full literary expression. One might point, for example, to the rabbinite Karite divide or the, or the new halakhic literature in Arabic. Perhaps the central element of this literary activity was the exegesis of scripture. The surviving manuscripts reflect an amazing flowering of the exegetical enterprise. Indeed, Jews in Arabic speaking land lived in a scripture suffused intellectual environment, in which the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Quran provided the important foundation blocks of a rich and complex religious intellectual culture. The foremost exemplars of the new Judeo Arabic biblical exegesis are the systematic, comprehensive commentaries that treat biblical text in a verse by verse fashion. These commentaries focus to a large extent on explicating the literal sense of the biblical text and often make use of grammatical, syntactic, or rhetorical analysis. Commentators of this sort were written by a large number of authors. I will begin the list with Daniel Kumisi, even though he wrote in Hebrew and wrote a bit before our defined period. In addition, I am not quite sure that his ex beautiful approach accords with that of, our, of the authors coming after him, but I will include him since some of these authors reacted to his exegesis. The list of 10th century exegesis is rather long, which I give in roughly chronological order. It includes Saj Gaon, Yaqub al Kirtisani, Aaron Sajar Gaon, Salman Bani Ruhim, Abu Nasser ibn Barhun, Raf El bin Khayyim, Yad ibn Ali, Sal bin Matsliyah, Shmuel al Khafi Gaon, Dali bin Boaz, and Yusuf ibn Nuh. This is the final list for one century now. And of course, there are all these like the other authors whose works have not survived or which have not yet been identified. In addition to these large continuous commentaries, there are a number of other genres concerned with the biblical exegesis. There are fragments of a large number of exegetical works in the form of questions and answers in which the author shows to deal with only specific points in the biblical text. For example, there is one author who for each parasha treats only ten issues. These are most likely the books, most likely the books that are mentioned in Gideon's book lists as nukat, or points of issue in exegesis. Lady Vignette does not produce such a work. In addition, there are fragments of books which appear to have been essays on specific topics. For example, there is a fragment of a book by a follower or student of Sadia that deals with the use of allegorical language in the Bible. Such, as, such, as, such essays were also written by the Kofiko. Now, you may have noticed that I have mixed up Rabbinite and Karite authors in my list of biblical Bible commentators. This was done on purpose. We have a tendency to relate to Rabbinite and Karite exegesis, exegesis as operating in separate camps, if not in separate worlds. I think, however, that it is important to treat, to treat Judeo Arabic exegesis as a cultural, intellectual, unitary whole. Even though the Judeo Arabic intellectual and religious world was clearly divided into rabbinites and Karaites, there was a very important conversation between the two camps, and not on just political issues. While exegesis of the legal passages of the Bible was clearly going to be very different, often, often polemically charged, interpretation of narrative and prophetic sections provided room for a group of different sort of interactions. I would like to give two relevant examples. Yaakov al Kirtisani. A Karite author writing in the early decades of the 10th century wrote a lengthy commentary on the Examron, as we just heard from, from Roni, uh, The Six Days of Creation, entitled Tafsir Rishi. In the introduction to the commentary, Alpikar Sain wrote that he had two main sources for his book. The first, Daud al Mukamas, he mentions explicitly. Al Mukamas, who was active in the first part of the 9th century, had written a examinant commentary called Tatiba Khalika, Kitab Khalika, which he adapted from Syriac sources. al Kusani, however, does not name his second main source. Bruno Kiyas has demonstrated that this is actually Sajidon. Um, and as Roni has now shown us, 
The beginning of Sadhu's commentary to Genesis also belongs to the genre of examiner commentaries. Alfred Rasani may have been reluctant to name Sadhu for political reasons, or perhaps he wanted to be generous because he was still alive at the time. My second example comes from Barak Lovin Khayyim, who was a rabbinic author who wrote several commentaries on prophetic books in the middle of the 10th century. In his commentary on Jeremiah, Raphael quotes quite positively, positively from Psalm and Benny Rukin's Psalm, Psalm commentary, uh, where he gives a number of possibilities of how to understand the verse, Kalut Philot David Ben Shai. Psalm and Benny Rukin was a Karaite uh, commentator who was active in Baghdad and Jerusalem in the first part of the 10th century. Raphael goes on to discuss Psalm's suggestions with no hint that he is citing some from an opposing camp. In both of these cases, we can see that the authors from both sides shared a common world of intellectual and exegetical discourse. When considering rabbinic intellectual life in the 10th century, perhaps due, to, perhaps due to the surviving historical sources, we tend to concentrate on the Yeshiva of Surah and Kumadita, the Batemi Drash in places such as Kairwa, and the Talmudic and Halakha studies that they promoted. Indeed, two of the central rabbinic entities were Gaomi. While this is a topic for a completely different lecture, or perhaps a semester's course, we do need to keep in mind that Talmudic that studies at this time were largely a professional matter for those who sought positions of leadership as Zionine. In addition, we might assume that individuals associated in some way with Yeshiva and the other families, a fairly small circle, were also exposed to the study of Talmud. Some Gyoni, such as Shmodan Pochni Gyon, did seek to expand the range of students at Talmud and to make it accessible to beginners, for example, by means of his introduction to the study of Mishnah and Talmud. Most of Jewish intellectual life outside of these centers, however, appears to be centered on the study of scripture with some interest in philosophy and theology as well. The perspective of a, of a contemporary Muslim author may be useful here. The historian al Masudi, writing in the first part of the 10th century, provides a list in his Kitab al Tanbi while Ishraq of the leading authoritative interpreter, interpreters of scripture among, among the Jews, many of whom he had met in person. The impression he gives is that as far as he was aware, these were the leading Jewish scholars in his time. He was particularly impressed by Sajidon and gives a number of details of his career, including his conflict with ex Aliba Zakai. He describes many of the individuals in his list as also being skilled in the study of science, study of sciences. It is a different Significant for us, however, that other than Sajia, Al Masudi does not mention any Talmudic authorities, Gaonim or otherwise, not even the energetic and forceful Aaron Zardar Gaon, who did write some Bible commentaries. These individuals evidently did not impress Al Masudi as intellectual leaders. I would now like to touch briefly on some of the broad issues concerning Jewish Bible exegesis in the 10th century, its beginnings in the 9th century the impact of the Christian and Islamic cultural context, its relationship with rabbinic midrashic exegesis, and the function of exegetical works as a means of organizing knowledge. The earliest datable source we have for Arabic Bible translation exegesis is a response by Nachmanai Bar Hilai Gaon, who served as Gaon Yeshiva Surah in the middle of the 9th century. The issue raised in the response is the practice of reading the Aramaic translation of one course in the synagogue. Custom was to read the Torah, one verse in Hebrew, followed by the Aramaic translation, and so on. There were some people in Naturanai's time who maintained that it was not, not necessary to use the Aramaic translation, but that the Torah text should be translated into, in dry quote, our language, a language which the community understands. This language was presumably Arabic. Naturanai <laughs> argues that it is essential to use the Uncleus translation, as this translation was accepted by, as authoritative by rabbinic tradition. And people do not understand the Arabic translation, they should learn. He ends, however, by saying, and I quote, if there is a place where they desire that the Torah text be explained to them, someone other than the Mutagate, who is reading the Aramaic translation, should stand and interpret for him and interpret for them in their language. We can, we can conclude from this response that in the middle of the 9th century, there was a generally accepted Judeo-Arabic translation proof with which some sought to replace the Aramaic translation in the synagogue. Chavad and Shemai has suggested further that the final sentence of the response indicates 
that there was already in use a corpus of Arabic Bible commentary circulating either orally or in form. And as a matter of fact, fragments of 9th century biblical translations, biblical glossaries, and texts of biblical questions and answers written in early Semitic Arabic orthography haven't been found, haven't found in the meanings of the Cairo. Professor Yoshu Oblau has demonstrated that these early Bible translations provided the building blocks for Sajid Gohm's Arabic translations. We, however, have no way of judging based on these small fragments how widespread was the use of Judeo-Arabic translations or how extensive these early Judeo-Arabic exegetical works may have been. There were a number of elements in the cultural environment of the 10th century Jews that encouraged and shaped the growth of Judeo-Arabic exegetical activity. We have just seen there was the obvious and felt need for making the Bible and its interpretation available in Arabic, as there are more and more Jews who have difficulties understanding difficult Hebrew and Aramaic texts in depth. Beyond this basic linguistic need, however, there was a further need to present the Bible, to present the biblical text in cultural terms understandable to Jews who had been who had become immersed in Arabic intellectual life. There are many Jews who become quite culturally assimilated and for whom the pivot of their Jewish identity was scripture. There were Jews who participated in the highest circles of Baghdadi Adept culture, attending the various Majali support discussion sessions. One of these was Wad ibn Yahisha Raki, a friend of Abu Khaynan Tafidi, a leading Baghdadi literature in the middle of the 10th century. Wad ibn Yahish is reported as having, as having said, and I quote, We are convinced that Musa, that is Moshe Rabbeinu, peace be upon him, said that God created man not for the dissolution or not for dissolution for eternal life, but he created him and created intellect for him to use with regard to virtues of the soul or the desires of the body. If he chooses the desires of the body, he will be overtaken by alteration of the body. And if he chooses the virtues of the soul, he will attain eternal and enduring life. And this was translated to us with difficulty. End of quote. The difficulty he refers to was probably more than just the translation of Moses' words from Hebrew, but rather translating the Bible into a framework of ideas that was meaningful to him. While Huab ibn Yaish may be an, an extreme example, who is part of the group to whom Sajia Gaon refers frequently in his Bible commentaries as, quote, those who embrace speculative contemplation and investigation, and who formed a significant, significant part of his intended audience. The Karaite scripturalist ideology that seems to have, consolidated, to have consolidated in the latter part of the 9th century provided a strong stimulus for executable literary activity. Perhaps foremost was the need to find the legal material basis for sectarian literary, acti uh, li sectarian literary religious practice. As reflected in the Sidney Scott of Yisrael ben Daniel, a Karaite author active in the latter part of the 9th century. This need, however, soon expanded to include the elucid elucidation of the non-legal parts of scripture as well. This dynamic is perhaps manifest in the writings of Yaakov Al-Kikusani, who first produced his legal work, Ifan al Mar Mar Wal Maraki, completed around the year 927, and who then wrote a commentary on the non-legal parts of the Pentateuch, as Ifan al Riyad al Tadai, completed in 938. While the impetus of what we might call user-focused needs but certainly a critical factor there were other aspects of 9th and 10th century culture that had a, had a shaping impact on the nature of and content of judeo arabic exegesis. The traditions of Syriac Christian Bible exegesis and exegesis of the Quran, which just, just attained its classic form. The impression made by the Syriac exegetical tradition on judeo arabic exegesis is somewhat elusive and subtle. It was, however, clearly there. I can give a few quick examples. In an, an anonymous 9th century text, Biblical Questions and Answers, the author gives Ezra Hasselfer a major role in editing the Hebrew Bible, seeing him as responsible for the interpolation of editorial remarks, such as the gloss, Elohim Tuba al Sefer Yashar, found in Joshua and 2 Samuel. This is far beyond the role of Ezra as described in rabbinic sources, but quite in keeping with that found in the Christian fathers. Another example would be the commentary on Examaron by Gabriel Amukamas that he translated from Syriac sources, and which Alfred Kassani used extensively in his own work of this sort. While a Examaron commentary, more a theological and scientific work than biblical commentary, 
the studies show one of the ways in which the Christian intellectual tradition found its way into the into Judeo Arab culture. A final example is the well known story told by Matzeh al Bazak from, from Sicily, and his biography of Hayekon, by Eid Santa Shmulan Agib. Matzeh recounts that during a study session with Hayekon in Yeshiva, a difficult verse from Psalms came up, and those present could not agree on how to interpret it. Hayek Gaon therefore, thereupon requested from Matsliach that he go to the, to the Nestorian Catholic laws to inquire how the Christian tradition <coughs> explained the verse. Matsliach was reluctant to do so, but he did obtain from the Catholic laws the Syriac translation of the verse. Coming from Sicily, Matsliach was evidently not comfortable with the cosmopolitan atmosphere in Baghdad. Hayek Gaon, though, seems to have had no problem in seeking information from Christian sources. Besides showing us that biblical, biblical exegesis was pursued in the Gaon Kishikos, this story also demonstrates another vector by which Christian exegetical traditions may have entered Jewish exegetical discourse. In this regard, it is important to recall that Syriac Christian exegesis continued the approach of the School of Antioch. Indeed, the central theological and exegetical authority of the Church of the East was Theodore of Mopsuestia, one of the main representatives of the Antioch, Antioch School of Exegesis. While the Alexandrian school tended to read the Old Testament in a typological fashion, the Antioch, Antioch exegesis saw the text of the Old Testament as having its own meaning and integrity, and were concerned with understanding the details of its narrative. Theodore Mopsuestia expressed, expressed his dislike of the Alexandrian approach in this way, I quote from his commentary action on the Gospel of John. Uh, when they, that is the Alexandrians, start expanding, start expounding divine scripture spiritually, spiritual interpretation is the name they like to give their folly. They claim that Adam is not Adam, paradise is not paradise, the serpent is not the serpent. This Antiochian concerned for Pshat undoubtedly had some role in forming the Pshat focus of Judeo Arabic exegesis. Research in this field, however, is still in its infancy. The role of Quran exegesis on the formation of Judeo Arabic exegesis can be seen on two levels. First, it's possible that the genre of a, of a comprehensive systematic scriptural commentary itself was adopted from the Islamic genre of tafsir. It is true that the of tafsir, such as that of Muqattadiz and Suleiman in the middle of the 8th century, are narrative exegesis and not similar to uh, our Judeo Arabic works. At the beginning of the 9th century, however, there was a turning point in Quran exegesis with the introduction of grammar and the linguistic sciences. For example, in Abu Abayda's Majad al Quran and in Qutayb's theological works such as Mushta al Quran and Arad al Quran. In the latter, of the latter half of the 9th century, Al Tabari produced the first of the classical works of Tafsir, in which citation of myth of multiple interpretations was emphasized. Works of this sort may have served as a model for Judeo Arabic. Uh, uh, authors. A second level of influence is found in the technical vocabulary and analytic tools used by both commentary. Judeo Arabic exegetes made use of central technical terms such as al Mukim, Mutak Mutashabi, Ekhtisar, and Parina, taken from Quranic exegesis. Please explain, it, but I'll explain them now due to the lack of time. I would propose, though, that instead of imagining that our Jewish exegetes were closely studying Quran commentaries, these borrowed terms most likely came from books on legal theory, which full of in which problems in exegesis and the appropriate both analysis are discussed in depth. An important issue for us when examining Judeo Arabic exegesis is the continuity of cultural traditions, that is, the relationship of the new exegesis with the rabbinic midrash. This is an, an important issue to understand the nature of Judeo Arabic culture as a whole and the beginnings of medieval Jewish culture in Arab lands. Our exegetes actually had a two-sided approach to rabbinic midrash, critical on the one hand and adoptive on the other. A critical attitude toward, toward midrash was expressed by all the well-known building of the 10th century. The first known expression of this attitude is found in the 9th century text of questions and answers, which I mentioned above. After recommending the study of rabbinic texts, such as the Talmud as preparing for the proper solution of textual problems in the Bible, the anonymous author wrote, and I quote, as for things like the Agadah and Pewt and similar things, do not decide on the basis of them at all. For they have been collected from interpretations and they contain some things which are true and some things which are not. 
all according to the breadth of the knowledge of the person who composed them. Perhaps a hundred years later, Shiragon wrote in a similar vein. I quote uh, from a response of Shira. These matters which are developed in verses and call me Drash and Agada are guesswork. Therefore, one does not trust Agada and Aisad, that is the early authorities, who did not learn from Agadot. The correct approach is that we accept from them that which has support from common sense and scripture. There is no end, however, to Agadot. End of quote. We can see that the Rabbinite exegetes felt quite independent vis a vis rabbinic and Russian exegesis. On the other hand, they did make wide use of Midrash, Midrash materials, often without indicating their source, or at the best, saying that a particular exegetical passage came from, quote, ancient authorities. Sajigon will at times rework and paraphrase Midrashic passages in Arabic, of course. Even though he may read his rabbinic sources critically, his inner world was still founded on rabbinic tradition, and he had a strong desire for cultural continuity. He made use of Midrashic traditions, these were often filtered, altered, or reformulated to conform with 10th century sensibilities. We do find an interesting phenomenon inside this commentary that together with a rational shot analysis, he may have a very rabbinic dress shot, sometimes in his own creation, as if he wanted to expose its 10th century adept and kalam oriented audience to rabbinic discourse. The Karaites also may use rabbinic exegetical materials, despite their ideological critique of rabbinic tradition. Midrash was also part of their cultural heritage. As the era Polyak has shown, an attentive reading of the Epic's commentary on Hosea will find there, here and there, Midrash materials underlying his interpretation. When reading the commentaries of Salvin Matsliach, one is constantly struck by the Midrashic ideas he makes use of. Sal, I should mention, Sal is a contemporary of Yetzirah uh, and some of the bar proof tests. Um, Sal also, um, also, also makes use of an interesting literary structural device which convinces his familiar, familiarity with the rabbinic literature. At the beginning of each parasha, he has a mukadima, an introduction. Each mukadima consists of verses from Psalms and a passage from the prophets. Sal then creates a homily that connects each of these together with the content of the parasha. This structure is highly reminiscent of the petit ot found in rabbinic Midrash. The centrality of the biblical exegesis in Judeo-Arabic culture also encouraged its use as a means of organizing and imparting knowledge. Many of our exegetes embedded in their commentaries lengthy digressions on diverse topics, whether it, to, whether it be poetic passages in the scripture, nature of dreams, or the varieties, varieties of sacrifices. Sometimes these digressions were actually small books with numbered chapters, it's found in Yetim. I would like to describe briefly a different, different sort of exegetic work which also demonstrates this function of exegesis. Tadr ibn Salkum was a wool merchant in Mosul, participated in a group that would gather together on the Sabbath, a event of the inner synagogue, in order to discuss issues of biblical exegesis in connection with philosophy. As a sort of record of his group's deliberations, Tadr wrote a book, Kitab al Manazir, which he completed in the year 982, although it reflects discussions that took place at least 20 or more years before. The declared overall purpose of the book is to demonstrate the harmony between biblical verses, what Tabakal calls al Ibrani, and between philosophy, which he refers to as the views of Fatima al The book is structured as a commentary on certain verses relevant to topics such as the function of the eye or music. Even though some of the sections of the book read like, read like lengthy philosophical brushot in a neoplatonic vein, Taba is also concerned with understanding the understand means of the verses. Kitab al-Nazir and the Sabbath discussions that preceded it demonstrate how people made use of the Bible in order to organize and structure their new intellectual world and to connect it to their cultural foundations. We can't say much, we can't say much about 10th century judeo arabic exegesis as I have just done. We are, however, just at the beginning of its investigation. Almost all of the basic infrastructure work of creating critical editions and translating the texts remains to be accomplished. Only when this is done can we effectively evaluate this corpus and investigate its details. In order to begin moving forward on this front, Miriam Goldstein and I have initiated a project dealing with the 10th, the 10th century Judeo Arabic exegesis. We have begun with the reconstruction of Sachigon's commentary on Leviticus, Philip Hawkins' commentaries on Numbers and Deuteronomy, and Rafael and Chaim's commentary on Jeremiah. 
We have planned to begin work on our fifth design to have a regard of the day this coming fall. We hope to make, we hope in the future to make available preditions of the of these commentaries. In general, as more exegetical texts are made available to the scholarly community, we'll be able to deepen and expand our understanding of the culture. Thank you. Because you know, it's 